Look at me, that's right. <laughs> Fighting patients while doing procedures is something every doctor experiences on pediatrics. Like how do we do blood tests on babies that are moving and fighting you? Very excited to be reacting to House MD season three, episode 15, half wit. On this channel, we are reacting to all 177 house videos. This will be episode 75. Let's see if I can get the diagnosis before house does as a doctor working in London. 25 years ago, Patrick was in the fourth grade. And then there was the accident, and here we are. Raising money for people with similar neurological disabilities. Are you all set? All set. He's never missed a note. Something's wrong. Very interesting opener. So we know our patient had a brain injury and developed permanent consequences because of it. They're not all bad though, as he developed what we call perfect pitch. That means he knows exactly what note something is just by hearing it. That gift is likely part of acquired savant syndrome, which is insanely rare. Only about 50 cases have ever been reported and people can gain extraordinary skill in music, art, maths, or another field. As interesting as that is though, it's House going to be able to see him because he promised Cuddy more clinic sessions for keeping him out of the slammer. Just after the turn of the millennium, there was a patient named Derek Amato who developed a genius ability to play the piano just after a head injury similar to this patient. This four-year-old corporate sales director had been diagnosed with a severe concussion and he'd mostly slept since the injury. Once he was a bit better, he started feeling drawn to piano keyboards. What happened next is absolutely insane. He sat down and started playing complex chords that he'd never heard of and kept it up for five hours. Famously, he described the music as bursting through his skin. Here's the most insane part. Derek had never played the piano before. <laughs> Delving into how he plays his music though, Derek is a savant that can see sound. That's classic of a condition called synesthesia. The word is Greek for joint perception and can mix any of our senses like smelling color, seeing sounds or hearing smells. Scientists aren't exactly sure how this could happen, but think it's down to incorrectly regulated neural bridges between senses. It's definitely not all sunshine and symphonies though. The gift came with some very debilitating side effects for him like headache, that were so bad they made him want to not be alive. They were extreme migraines with light sensitivity, hearing loss, memory loss, and sound sensitivity as well. A superpower with a price. Let's see if our patient has the same. 35 year old savant, dystonia in his left hand. He pays just at five in the morning for that? Clonazepam will take care Sorry of it. Sorry, I'm Clonazepam. I'm going back to bed. Where are you going? Bathroom. I think I might. I want new labs CBC with platelets, chem panel, thyroid, and adrenal function tests. What are you looking for? I just want to make sure whatever happened doesn't happen again. Spine's okay. Tie this off. Does this have anything to do with my foot? You have a blister. Waste the doctor's time with more important things, like the sewer that's being vented out of your mouth. Your gnarly fingers say, House is running clinics at 5 a.m. Well, I guess it's useful to get a patient to help you take your own blood. Why exactly? Hope we find out. The sign he's talking about, which gives away that she's been making herself puke, is called Russell's sign. It's caused by repetitively sticking your hand down your throat to stimulate vomiting, like in bulimia nervosa, and can cause calluses to build on the knuckles. Even though patients with bulimia have an eating disorder, they most commonly aren't underweight. That's because they will binge eat and then be overcome with guilt and vomit up the food again, by which time some of it has already been absorbed. Other signs of the condition can be tooth erosion, frequent bathroom visits, excessive exercising, being overly preoccupied with your body image, and withdrawing socially from friends and family. How is an eating disorder treated though? Well, the first step would be psychotherapy using a type called CBT. Nutritional counseling can teach healthier ways to eat as well, and support groups help patients connect and share stories, and medication can treat any coexisting anxiety or depression. Motor cortex looks good, everything checks out. You're using the wrong equipment. Close your eyes. D, G flat, A flat, B. Yeah, he's great. He's staying. Call radiology. I need a functional MRI of his brain. I want to see the music. His heart rate rose. Once there's no activity in the limbic system, unless there's a problem with his heart, 
do an echo to confirm. He's gonna need surgery. House now adds pianist to a list of skills alongside entomologist, historian, and alchemist. Not sure about his doctor title though, as he's gone that the patient needs heart surgery from a fast heart rate. How can that be justified? Well, House is saying that if the fast heart rate was because of an emotional response to the music, then the emotion centers in the brain should be lighting up, which they're not. So that means something else must be causing the fast heart rate, and that something else must need surgery. That's quite the stretch as there are more causes of fast heart rate than fluorescent patches in a gym locker room. Anything that stimulates the fight or flight nervous system is included in that, and not all of them may be shown by the limbic system. Stress, high thyroid hormone, infection are just some examples. What's even more interesting than that though, is House wanting to see the music with functional MRI, because that was just made possible with AI. Bellier and colleagues published it in August 2023, and they managed to reinterpret a data set of fMRIs of 29 patients listening to Pink Floyd, another brick in the wall. A sample of the original song part sounds like this. The AI then tried to recreate that sound based on the fMRI images of the people's brains while they were listening to it, and it created this. Yes, it sounds muffled and like it's being played underwater, but it's got the melody, which is pretty cool from a set of brain pictures. Who knows what that tech might lead to in one or two decades? Question for you smart people. What would you want to see people do while having an fMRI and why? Answers down below. It's got a heart condition that caused the arteries in his arm to constrict. Do you have any idea why House would want to go to Boston? I heard there's an opening at Harvard for division chief infectious disease. Almost at the heart, bleeding. Heart rate's 160. It's accelerating. He's at 210. Out, clear. This high school yearbook. He's not smiling. What's the area code for Boston? 617. Why? Massachusetts General, may I help you? You can tell this was filmed 20 years ago. Imagine phoning a hospital and getting straight through to speak to someone without a million COVID disclaimers. Either way, it seems like Cameron and Chase broke into Dr. House's home trying to figure out why he wants to go to Boston. Yes, that position is open, but why else would a doctor fly across the country to go to a different hospital? Maybe he's giving a lecture, their team needs a consult, or he's not going there as a doctor, he's going as a patient. Speaking of patients though, we have one to diagnose. Foreman's saying that the patient's got a heart condition that's restricting blow to the left arm. Sounds like something called an aortic dissection. If there's a defect in the inner lining of the aorta, then blood can start flowing in there and are tearing the layers of the vessel apart from each other. There are three main branches that come off the aorta and supply the brain and the arms. If the defect is after the first two, then that could cause reduced blood flow to the left arm without the other parts being affected. A good way to suspect it would be a tearing pain in the chest, radiating to the back, and at different blood pressures in both arms. Having high blood pressure for a long time in life is a big risk factor for that happening. A CT angiogram could diagnose it, and a cardiothoracic op would be needed to fix it if the defect is that high up. Something tells me that isn't quite the whole story though. Did you think you could steal Dr. House without a fight? We're not looking to hire him. If he's not coming there for a job interview, he's either coming to your hospital for a social visit or because he's a patient. I can't stand House. Neither can Dr. Cooper Smith. Do you know Dr. Cooper Smith in Boston? What's his subspecialty? Brain cancer. The heart problem couldn't have caused the hand problem. Unless the bleed happens suddenly. Scope him above and below. If that doesn't work, got him. Can't sedate him? Hurt me. Why hurt me? Whoa, 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 wait, does House have a brain tumor? Maybe that's what's making all his insane diagnoses. Now you might expect most people with a brain tumor would want some time off, but not House. He's not alone in working while sick though. A study published in 2015 that surveyed 500 health professionals found that 83% worked while sick in the last year. That includes working with diarrhea, a fever, or more significant respiratory symptoms like wheeze. The main reason for doing that is they were worried there weren't enough staff to take on the workload in case they couldn't go to work. It's happened to me during training as well. We get a set limit of days that we need to attend, and if we miss more than around 14 days a year, then our training is extended. 10 days of that I missed because my child was born, two days were because my wife had bowel obstruction, and one day I had to take my dad to hospital for chest pain. So I was left with one day of sick leave and I got the flu. I had a day off, but the next day I had 
allowed to go in, my eyes were red, I had to wear a mask and wipe my nose every few seconds, my patients even kept asking me if I was okay. I'm definitely not doing that again though and I'll just take the extension next time. What's way more interesting though is what's happening with our patient. He had a cardiac arrest during an unknown procedure for a spasm of the blood vessels in an unknown area. Foreman now thinks the fact he had a cardiac arrest means that doesn't explain his symptoms even though the rhythm he had is supraventricular tachycardia which doesn't cause cardiac arrest. He was shocked pretty quickly as well, kind of like me at the writer's accuracy on that one. There's more as well because why can't they sedate this poor patient. Chase says it's because the throat could close up. Well, nothing closes up throats like trying to shove a probe down them. That makes no sense. We've had all of zero indication that this guy is any higher risk than anyone else, and we know he's vulnerable because of his brain injury. The sedative we would usually use is called midazolam. We can give it directly into the vein, and it has a calming effect and relaxes the muscles to make it a smoother experience for everyone. If the patient or carer wants it, then there's zero reason to withhold it. Surely this is gonna be a disaster now. Look at me now. You need to talk about it. Give me at least six months. Go to Boston, we'll get the treatment. Everything will be fine. The surgeon found a blade behind the kidney and the retroperitoneal cavity, but no reason for it. You guys have cleverly deduced that I have cancer. Just want to make sure you weren't misdiagnosed. We're going to proceed as if I am perfectly healthy. So why are his seizures getting worse? We take him off anticonvulsant medication. Once he gets worse, do a PET scan. Fighting patients while doing procedures is something every doctor experiences on pediatrics. Like how do we do blood tests on babies that are moving and fighting you? Newborns have very small veins, but don't fight back much so they're actually not as difficult as you might expect. Four to five year olds are usually all right as you can generally distract them with something like Baby Shark or Celine Dion which was playing in my gym this morning. It's the toddlers that are the problem. Even when their parents are holding them well, they scream, they put their hips forward, they slide down out of the grips, they scratch and bite. Sometimes we even need two people to hold them down. That actually reminds me of the most difficult patient we've ever taken blood from. It was a 15 year old girl on pediatrics who had Down syndrome. Her mom said that previous doctors had tried everything and the best way to take blood from her was if the mom lays on top of the girl, kind of hugging her. We ended up needing four extra people on top of myself and thankfully we got it first time. Always listen to parents. It seems like House has now admitted to having this brain tumor. There are a massive range of tumors though from benign ones that usually just stick around and not grow like meningiomas all the way to hyper aggressive tumors that can unalive you within two years. Maybe we'll find out which it is later in the episode. Symptoms of a brain tumor are things like a headache that can wake you up from sleep, it's worse in the morning or on coughing or sneezing, double vision, weakness on one side, facial droop or even seizure can be symptoms as well. House doesn't seem to have any of those though. Speaking of seizure, we do have new clues with our patient. House earlier said bleeding could have caused his original hand symptoms and so wanted to rule out a bleed by doing top and tail camera tests. If there were a significant bleed though, you would be able to find that out on a simple stool test first rather than probing him more than an alien abduction. House then said if they don't find anything there, then do exploratory surgery. Why? All this fancy technology and being able to jump straight to MRI scans and your technology of choice is the most high tech of all, a scalpel. Either way, three things came from this. The patient's bowels are clean, there's a bleed behind his left kidney, and he's having seizures even though he's on anticonvulsants. With a normal MRI of his head, that is a tough constellation of symptoms to tie together. I bet though that whatever it is would have contributed to him having the accident in the first place. I definitely wanna know the details of what happened there before sticking any more needles or scalpels in the poor guy or withholding his seizure meds, which is what House plans to do. I know this is fixed but a real doctor somewhere actually came up with this stuff. Madness. This is a letter of recommendation. I'm applying for a job at Penn. Thank you for writing your own. If you're not here, there's not much point in staying. What are you doing? Little whores to kiss and stab. All we need is a few drops of your blood. Record room under the name Luke and Laura. There's a whole vial of blood there, along with CT scans, MRI, CSF, everything you need. Six centimeter mass in his dorsal midbrain, extending into the temporal lobe. 
That's inoperable. Wait, what? How did Foreman see that mass was extending into the midbrain when the slice on the screen doesn't even show the midbrain in it? They have a physical copy and so when we used to use these in medicine, we would get multiple images at different vertical levels. The reason why is this image that we can see is taken in the transverse plane. So imagine someone was cut horizontally and you're looking up at the top slice from the patient's toes. That's what you can see on the scan. So you would need different slices at different vertical levels to see all the structures. Nowadays, we don't have to worry about this too much. We just have a scrolling wheel and we can go up and down on the scan. Regardless, that does unfortunately look like a malignant tumor. The edges are quite irregular and it's what we call heterogeneous, which means there's not one density of tissue. Maybe he's playing a trick on the team and this isn't actually his scan. If he had a tumor that big in his brain, then there's no way he'd still be functioning so well. I wanna use my first diagnostic guess on that, but we're not diagnosing house. What kind of time does he have? I just got a year. Earth! Pet revealed several more hotspots. They're non-specific. Bleeding in the brain might cause the seizures to get worse. Yes, he needs an angiogram to look at the vasculature inside his brain. I got it. You're busy. Continue. Bleeding into his brain. He's dying. You can't just randomly stab the temporal lobe and hope you hit the right spot. I'm only gonna take little tiny pieces. Oh, we have a new clue. Bleeding in the brain. House also mentioned something curious while he was doing the procedure on the patient. He asked him if he liked his life, getting girls and touring, and the patient said he doesn't like girls. What if the brain injury he had when he was younger wasn't actually a brain injury and he's actually got syphilis. We've not seen this child's mom either, so what happened to her? Maybe she gave it to him during childbirth and he developed a brain injury after a decade when it spread to his brain. It can also cause microbleeds and the cramping symptoms the patient had, or if it is that though, it means that if they treat it, then they cure his disease, but may get rid of his piano playing abilities as well. That would be so interesting and very house-esque. That's gonna be my first diagnostic guess. What else could it be? House said that he had something called a white matter lesion in his right brain. There are very specific causes of that with more well-known ones being things like MS or Lyme disease. Spicier causes could be acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, acute hemorrhagic leukoencephalopathy, oxycodone use or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. The last one is associated with AIDS and that definitely could be a diagnosis as well. So is House right to want to just jab around where the problem is and see what sticks? Definitely not. There are loads more tests you could do to diagnose this like blood cultures, HIV and syphilis screen, tox screen, lumbar puncture with culture and testing for oligoclonal bands. For MS, then take it from there. What if we do the EEG from inside his brain. Go, do. It's either you go cancer or autoimmune like disease. Sorry, yeah. Intracranial EEG showed no electrical abnormalities. It also showed his entire right hemisphere is brain dead. Is it gonna be okay? I'm sorry. Yes! What's this? The piano. What's this? Whoa, 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 Foreman's trying to show that since the whole right side of his brain is dead, that he can't see from his right eye. That's beyond untrue. You see, parts of the brain don't control each eye separately. They control parts of your visual field. So if you had what this patient has and lost your entire right hemisphere, then you would lose your entire left field of vision in both eyes. That's what we would call a left homonymous hemianopia. That's because the optic nerves that come from the retina take an intersecting path through the brain to keep the visual fields of each side together. The inner part of the left retina and the outer part of the right retina both sense the left visual field and so run together into the right hemisphere. Interestingly, if the whole right hemisphere was not functioning, then his left arm and leg wouldn't be working either, so I doubt that's true. The thing that would cause complete loss of vision in one eye like that is called optic neuritis. That's associated with MS, where the body will attack the optic nerve of one side before that nerve splits its path. It causes the visual loss, but also is very painful, particularly on moving the eye since it stretches the optic nerve. House doesn't seem at all convinced by any of this though, so let's see what extra craziness he'll bring in here. 
Can't play the piano with half a brain. What's it mean? It means the right side of his brain is always sucked. Well, then it's autoimmune. It's likely ones we can fix. Polyarteritis nodosa, Takayasu, or sarcoid. I'll start treatment. So now they think the dead right brain has always been that way and somehow that means it's autoimmune. I think they're about as on the mark with this one as when Google Maps led a man's truck into a river. Thankfully, he only had minor injuries, but we can't say the same for his truck. The diseases Foreman mentioned do cause different symptoms as well to the ones our patient had, like polyarteritis arthritis nodosa causes weight loss, joint pain, skin rash, and blood in the stools. Takayasus can cause fever, fatigue, chest pain, shortness of breath, and lightheadedness. Sarcoidosis can come in with similar symptoms, but also a persistent dry cough and wheeze, none of which our patient has. I'm sure this treatment is about as likely to work as catcalling in the streets, but let's find out. I'm sorry you're dying. I'm gonna hug you. Are you crying? No. My patient with the 55 IQ has Takayasu syndrome. A hemispherectomy would completely stop the right brain seizure activity. You want to remove half his brain? You think we should remove the right side of your son's brain? And it's been dead weight ever since the accident. He never played the piano again. The piano is a neurological accident. I'm offering him a life. Are you happy? Out! <laughs> Open up! You don't have cancer. There was an abnormal presence of IgG and IgM indicating I don't have neurosyphilis. We did an FTA antibody test. The VDRL was a false negative. He doesn't have cancer. Did I say the patient had neurosyphilis? Clearly my brain hemispheres got crossed as I must have meant House has it instead. House thought of syphilis and did the usual screening test for it, which was negative. That can happen in early or late disease. The FTA test that the team mentioned though is still accurate and is positive in almost 100% of cases. Amazing to think that his team's refusal to accept that he could be dying led to this. It makes for a great story, but I do worry about the message that it sends to families though. It's easy to look at this and think, maybe my family member doesn't have cancer. Maybe the reason why they're dying is that we didn't push hard enough or gave up too quickly. In the real world, that would be extremely unlikely. We have one patient in our surgery now who's been diagnosed with genital urinary cancer and keeps wanting to be referred for second opinions. While waiting for these, she's actually delaying her surgery, which means that the likelihood of a cure is going down by the week. That being said, I got this patient's diagnosis massively wrong, so what right do I have to speak? Either way, I want to see what the patient's like with his right hemisphere removed. Believe it or not, we have used this to treat epilepsy previously. A patient called Brock from UCLA suffered with seizures almost all the time. These were subtle and couldn't really be detected just from looking at him, but were affecting his physical development. Then on occasion, he would have large complex partial seizures where he would go unconscious. His studies were suffering and his development started to halt while he was feeling tired all the time. They identified the source in the left brain and parents agreed to go ahead with the operation. It took 10 hours, but but was well worth it. Just six months after surgery, he's seizure free and his right brain has managed to take over the functions of language and movement as well with Brock's life being completely transformed. Crazy to think that half of something that's supposed to be our entire processing center can weigh someone down so much and that the other half can take over its job wholly. On a side note, I bet Cameron's happy she didn't go all in on the distraction now. All you need is IV antibiotics. You idiots. It wasn't my damn file. The real patient is in the Witherspoon wing. I wanted the guys in Boston to think that I had cancer. I wanted the guys who were going to implant a cool drug right into the pleasure center of my brain to think that I had cancer. Buttoned your shirt. It looks happy. I knew House was faking it. That half redeems my misplaced comparison of Takayasu's to catcalling. What drug could House have wanted the injection of though? There are implantable drugs that can deliver chemotherapy directly to brain tumors, but that's about as pleasurable as walking on nails, so probably not that. I've never heard of pain relief meds going in that way intracranially. Have you heard of that and what House is referring to? Let us know in the comments. Fun episode though, 8.5 out of 10 entertainment. I'd say five out of 10 accuracy, six out of 10 diagnosis. This episode doesn't make full sense until you watch the previous one where a girl can't feel pain here. Watch now.